Uh, uh, as you might know, if you followed my videos, you know that you never know <laughs> what's going to happen. So today I thought I'd try um, uh, this uh, AI image creation software called Stable Diffusion. What machine learning is. So I'm going to try, I'll draw it like this. Two axes. I just have more space. I could draw more efficiently. So maybe we can call this Y, this axis. This is output. And this is the input. You can call it X. So a basic uh, use case for machine learning. I have a few dots here. I can draw it like this. Uh, so uh, here you have this machine learning algorithm. Machine learning. And an input, you have um, training data. Training. And the training data in this case are those dots. And output comes, what? A model. Model. And I'm going to explain what this is. So it depends on which algorithm is used. But in, in my case, I want the model to be a line that fits through these dots here. So this line might look like this, if I change the color. So when I run this algorithm, it might come up with a line like this. I don't know, maybe something like that. So you can uh, imagine that this line, well, if we imagine it continues like this, it turns one time down here, and one time down here, and then another time down there. So it turns three times. You could also imagine it being only turning two times like this. One, two. So uh, the first thing to, is to decide which algorithm to use. So I think in this case, maybe a polynomial would be OK. Polynomial is like this. Y is a constant plus another constant, A0 and A1, times X. And this you might recognize this as the equation of a straight line. And if you add another term, it's called a polynomial. A2 times X1. Squared. Now I have a second degree. So if it looked just like this and then went down again, this would be a second degree. Because a second degree polynomial can change direction one time. But if it changes direction two times, then you can add another term. And if you imagine that it continues here, it changes direction three times, you can add another term. Uh, with x uh, raised to the fourth. Um, so the model in this case, okay, first the algorithm is a polynomial, and the model in this case are these constants, a0, a1, a2, a3. And that's basically the result of the output here. So you can actually write it like this. Hmm. And if you have more, you can just add them here. So if you know about polynomials, you know how many times this change direction, then you can already say that, OK, it's changed this direction three times. OK, I need four, up to A4. We actually use this uh, to predict, for instance, y values. Then you get an input, an x value. Maybe here, an x value. I call this x prim. And then you see, you go, you just go up to the curve, OK, up here. Uh, there. So I predict the corresponding y for this x to be here.
So that's basically what it does. So I first use training data to train a model, or the model in this case, or those constant, A0 to A3. And then I can predict when I get new X values, I can predict Y values based on this red curve. I also use something completely different. That's called, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, neural networks. And then you have like, I don't know, input layer like this. And you can have <laughs> intermediate layers. Uh, and then uh, an output layer like this. So, so, you have, so you have inputs like this into the input layer. And then the input layer is connected to another layer and to another layer. And then finally to the output layer. And then you get outputs. One or more outputs, depending on the neural network. So for instance, when working with images, each input here could be a pixel. So if you have a pixel here, maybe 100 times 100 pixels, then it will be a lot of pixels here, the different RGB values. The input would be 100 times 100 pixels, so lots of inputs here. So that's why it requires a lot of G, uh, uh, CPU power to calculate this neural network. And then the output will be the processed image. Uh, so uh, that's why uh, these modern uh, algorithms use the GPU instead of the CPU. Yeah, so that was the basics. And of course, in reality, it's more advanced. You can read about it, uh, how it works. So I used the one that's called stable diffusion. You can read about it here, and there's a lot of links. But what's uh, actually important is just to know it's this one, automatic 1111 one, GitHub account and the repository stable diffusion web user interface, web UI. And it describes how to install. It's pretty simple. It works on Linux and it works on Windows. I tried both, but on my Linux computer, I had too little video ROM. On my Windows computer, I had more video ROM, so it was easier to... Uh, it worked better. But... Uh, on the Windows computer, it was actually a little bit harder to install. The hardest thing was install in Python. So, but when so the first thing you should do is actually install Python is from this executable, and when it works, you should be able to open a command prompt and write Python there. Or just write Python, and you should get the Python prompt. Like that. Anyway, so after you install Python, and, uh, and you, you can uh, run it from command prompt, and you can, from uh, command prompt or PowerShell, just uh, continue to use the installer, and it will install everything else except the stable diffusion model. So that has to be installed separately. And uh, let's see, I think there's some dependencies somewhere. Dependencies here. There's a link to the stable diffusion. Uh, I think the latest is 1.4 CKPT file. You follow those, this link. You get to the stable diffusion, and it's this file SD version 1.4 1-4.ckpt. It's a pretty large file, four gigabytes. So, and I think you have to register to be able to download it. But, well, but this is the only file you have to download except for this repository. So you, you just uh, go to repository and clone it here. You can just copy this line here. Git clone this line here. Uh, and then let's see what's inside here. So here's, here I have the Windows substitution from Linux because I'm not used to Windows. I'm uh, used to Linux. So this is kind of a Linux prompt, but in Windows. It's in D, stable diffusion. Here has the repository I checked out. And the install script would be this web ui.bat. So you can just run this, but maybe not from the uh, Linux prompt, Windows substitution for Linux, but from uh, a PowerShell or a command line. CMD.exe, run this web UE.bat, and it will install everything else that's needed. So it's pretty simple. 
and I can start it from a PowerShell here. It is also possible to install under Windows Subsystems Linux by following the instructions on the page and basically you give feed it this YAML file for uh, uh, Windows Subsystems for Linux 2. But I didn't do that, I just ran this web UI.bat to install it directly on Windows. So the difference is uh, if I write ipconfig, uh, the Windows subsystems for Linux has this space. Uh, so the, the, the stable diffusion server would run uh, in this subnet while uh, my local Ethernet here is on my actual subnet. So I could, if I start the server on uh, address 0000, I could actually access the server from my son's room or anyone else that sits on my local network here, local area network. But if I install it under Windows Subsystems for Linux, I think I can only access it from this computer. Of course, you could do some advanced stuff like port forwarding to actually access it anyway. Um, but I thought it was simpler to just install it on the main interface here. Yeah, so let's start it. So now I only already ran it before, so everything is downloaded. And I added this argument, medium VRAM. It, it means I don't have very much video RAM on my GPU. So this is not default. But if you have a good GPU with lots of video RAM, you don't have to add some extra parameters to starting it. So I actually went into the Python file and added this uh, argument. Now it loads this uh, stable diffusion version of 1.4 CKPT. And it started the server on localhost, port 7860. So I can just open that here. Uh, oh, here I had. Oh, here's some um, uh, comparison between uh, Stable Diffusion, Mid Journey, and Dal E2. All these are similar. You can write a prompt and it returns an image. And you can also do uh, different things with Stable Diffusion, which I don't know if you can do with Midjourney and Dali 2. And Stable Diffusion is open source, or maybe some of it is also free software. But when I said open source, I mean both open source and free software. Um, yeah, enough talking, I can just show you how it works. So now I am connected to the server server that was launched here. It's just a Python script running. Um, so I can go into these different tabs here. And the text to image, that's the one that's uh, available in both Midjourney, DALI 2, and Stable Diffusion. So I can write a prompt. Um, a river running through fantasy landscape with snow-capped mountains in the background. And then I can also add um, an artist. I'm just going to add a random artist. So if I click on this button, it adds a random artist. You can also look up uh, which artists are available. So for instance, I think they're, they are in here in artists CSV. So uh, here it's also the cat category entered here. Uh, but I'm just going to do this random now, first time. And also here you can change different things. If you hover with the mouse, you can see that this CF key scale is classify free guidance. How strong the image should conform to the prompt. So lower, if you draw to the left, uh, it create more creative results. And to the right, uh, then um, it follows the prompt more, more. <laughs> so now it's generating. Let's see what's happening down here. So it does something. Uh, 20 iteration. So that was pretty fast. And it got a prompt here. It actually looks a little bit like a, 
river running through fantasy landscape with mountains in the background. So I can try changing out uh, an artist here, write something else by, I don't know, Leonardo. Is he even in there? Yeah, he's in there. Da Vinci with the space. Da Vinci. So I guess they used different um, image, images by Da Vinci to train a neural network model. And I don't know exactly how the stable diffusion model works, but you can go into the documentation and I think the official is in a hugging face here. So you, you could um, uh, diffusion based text to image generation model. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of technical information here, and here's, here's also a paper, which uh, maybe... Um, oh, so this is the original repository. Interesting. I should go in here and see. If I get, because I guess all these user interface repositories on GitHub has cloned this one. So this is the one that's the original. Yeah, anyway. Uh, here is a seed, so if I click the same prompt, everything the same, and click again, I will get a different image, because it just randomizes a seed. So seed, it's a random number for um, this pseudo-random uh, number generation algorithm. And I think, if I think, oh, okay, this looks good, I can lock the seed. I can click on this image, and it takes the seed it used in the last image here, and writes it in this box here. And if I generate again, I will, should get the, exactly the same image. And it's the same image. And now I can try to experiment moving this and see what happens. Oh, so now it's more free. And I've, if I move it more to the right, it follows the prompt more closely. And in my experience, it's more sharp. Yeah, the colors have become more sharp. If you want the software, you can draw it to the left. Maybe I want something in between, something like that. Yeah, maybe that looks good, a little bit more to the left. And now I can start to randomize again if I've found a good number for the CFG scale. So I can just click here until I found an image I look I think looks good. And if I get, get tired of Da Vinci style, I can just uh, I can just add another artist. I remove Da Vinci and click this button. I don't think you have to write by here. And I get completely different results, depending on which artist I write down here. And uh, I don't know what this here score is, but I guess it's some kind of rating how good it is. So I get the Peter Max is popular. I can try to enter that manually. And it's also labeled as weird, so let's see if it's weird. Yeah, a little bit weird, and if I move it to the left, let's see if we get more or less weird. Yeah, this looks like the prompt description. I move it more to the right. Ah, uh, not so good. To the left look better. <laughs> you can sit all day long. Just click here. I'm just going to try an another few artists. Roy Lichtenstein. Cartoon. So it should return cartoonish images because it's trained on cartoon pictures. I don't know if it looks like cartoon and move up that little bit.
Oh, this looks like the cartoon. Nice. <clears throat> and I can also go send this to image to image here. And then I can say, okay, I use this as image, this image, and this prompt as input. And it's going to use both prompt and the image. And then I can um, decide here how uh, much is this going to take from the image and how much it's going to take from the prompt. We we'll see if G-scale here is the same as before, and maybe that was good somewhere here. Um, and if I turn this all the way to the left, it's going to change nothing. It's going to be exactly the same image. The same image, and if I turn it, the more I turn it to the right, the more creative it gets, the more it takes information from the prompt. And now, since it's the same artist, but if I changed out the artist, uh, let's just take another artist. I don't know. Ukiyo-e. That's the, some kind of old Japanese art, I think. So it should... Okay, it should crash, it seems. <laughs> I crashed it. I think I closed the tab. Anyway, image to image. I'm just going to import. Import an image. This is from the Witcher game. Ah, maybe it's too, this is too wide. I want a more square image. Let's take that, Mona Lisa squared, okay? And now, uh, let's try to press this interrogate button, see what happens. You can see in the, in the uh, server window here what happens. So it's going to analyze the picture I dropped here using this model, uh, model base caption cap field large dot pth. And, you know, I didn't generate this image. I just dropped an image here and then press integrate and it described here a painting of a woman with long hair and a smile on her face with the landscape in the background by Leonardo da Vinci. That's pretty spot on. Uh, and now we can change the prompt a little bit. Maybe, maybe I change the artist. <laughs> uh, see if you scale like that. The noise. I don't know. I generate. So now it's going to take this image as input and the prompt here. But I the prompt is generated by interrogate. But I changed out the artist. So I'll get the mix by Da Vinci and Hiroshige. <laughs> so that could produce some pretty interesting results. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't have to paint uh, over all of it, so I can use this in-paint thing to only paint over uh, part of part of the image. So I, I'm going to draw a mask. Now this part here, which I painted black, will be replaced. The rest of the image will be as is in the output. And it will put the blur around and I can control how big the blur is using this. Um, okay, let's just go. Uh, the prompt is... Yeah, let's use the Hiroshige prompt. Ah, I'll just go with that, see what happens. So now <laughs> the image is as is, but it created a different face. <laughs> oh, that looked pretty nice. So I'm going to lock, lock that seed and then start experimenting, maybe moving the CFG, see how it changes. And the colors are bright. <laughs> and I want it to fit more into English, I, I, I draw it to the left, CFG. Yeah, and now it actually looks like it fits a little bit in the image. Draw it a little bit to the right. Oh, that looks pretty okay. And now let's see what happens if, if I move the denoise. If I move to the left, it should look more like Mona Lisa. 
Yeah, it looks more, a little bit more like Mona Lisa. With more to the left, it should look even more like Mona Lisa. Yeah, and if I move it more to the right, it should look more like <coughs> Hiroshige. Mm. And uh, here somewhere, somewhere in between those two. <laughs> it doesn't really look very good. I thought it looked better if I turned it down a little bit, this denoise. But now it looks almost like Mona Lisa. She's here. We can compare this some of this. <sighs> Maybe that was not very interesting. I'm just gonna change this out. Jo <sighs> What's that girl who played in Harry Potter? I think uh, Stable Tution knows her name. <laughs> Emma Watson, okay. So let's write her name in this prompt. Emma Watson. Lou, uh, painting of Emma Watson looking at camera. Camera, uh, let's go with that. Okay, so now it actually looks a little bit like Emma Watson. <laughs> ah, the seed is still locked. I'll randomize this a little bit. Ah, let's go with that one. So I lock this seed and maybe move the denoise a little bit to the right, see if it will look more like Emma Watson. Yeah, I think so. So this is kind of a deep fake technique to do it like this. And I think this looks pretty good. It actually looked like Mona Lisa painting, but with a face replaced with Emma Watson. And if I go to extras here, I can upscale this, the, and there are different algorithms. So I can also combine two. Maybe if I only go with this one, the, the second here, so I, I press none here on the first. So it will take 100% from the second upscaler. So it will upscale this image and create a larger image. You can also start uh, directly here and drop any image here and scale it up to make it larger. So that's pretty impressive. This input is only 512 times 512, and this output here is, is larger. But I think um, the face is too smooth compared to the surroundings. But still, it looks pretty impressive. Uh, and you could surely um, experiment a little bit. Maybe use that one instead. Let's see if it works. I think these LDS are only work with some resolutions. Let's see what it says if it... Yeah, yeah it works with 512. So at first it down samples it to 256 times 256 to get less input, uh, less n input neurons in the input layer. And it runs 100 iteration steps here. But it's pretty fast. It's 2.5 information technologies per second. No, it's 2.5 iterations per second, so it's pretty fast. And I can hear the fan going on on the GPU, because it's really working now. Yeah, so I think this looks better. The face blends in better here with the rest of the painting. And I can also do a combination of both. Maybe LDSR on that one, and BSR gone on this one, and also do a mixture of those two. And I can do one more thing. GFP gone here is used to, oh, now it doesn't write anything, but if you turn this up, uh, it will try to restore the face because uh, these uh, stable diffusion models can sometimes produce distorted faces. So GFP gone here tries to restore the face to make it look more natural. And I think Codeformer is another uh, uh, model to improve the face. So you could take a picture with a bad face and try GFP gone and Codeformer and see it, it, uh, it changes the, the face in different ways. And you can use a mixture of both. But I think this looks pretty good. Maybe the eye here looks a little bit unnatural. It might be better if I turn up 
GFB. Let's turn it up to 100%. But I think the face will be more smooth now, so it will not blend in so good. Let's see if it runs the 100 iterations again. Yeah, it's down sample. It's going to run 100 iterations. I can cut this out. Okay, so let's see how it, how it looked with both LDSR and BSR gone and the face restoration. Okay, now the eye looks better here, but it's, the face is too smooth. So it doesn't blend in with the background. I could actually uh, do an inverse mask here to do an operation on the everything except the face to change the rest of the image. So if I, I'm sending this image to InPaint, okay, and now I'm going to do, draw the face again. I click there, now it's going to change everything else. And now I can actually, what was it? I, I'm going to run integrate. <coughs> Painting on long hair and the smile frame with landscape background, but okay, I'm just going to use that. Go with the same settings. So the face should be as is, and but it's going to change the landscape. Okay, so now it kind of looks like Mona Lisa, but both the face and the background is changed now. And now the background and the face should look more similar. I'm going to send it to extras, do the same thing again. Maybe not run GFP gone. Anyway. When this is, I'm going to cut this, cut this out of the video. But when this has finished calculating, so even with the GPU, this takes time. When it's finished calculating, I hope it will look uh, better, like a real painting, with both the background and the foreground, the face, uh, the same amount of blurriness. Yeah. So this actually looks good. Okay. So now I think. Yeah, the face is still too smooth. If I remove this, let's do a code former instead, just to see the difference. Remember how the face looks here. So <laughs> the code former produces a different face. This face looks less like uh, Emma Watson, but it actually looks more like a real face. But it's still, I think it's a little bit too smooth still compared to the background. I'm going to remove both GFP gun and code former and only use upscaler one and upscaler two. LDSR and BSR gone. And uh, about 50% of both. So it depends what you're going for. Well, what you're going to use. Okay, so I, I'm actually very happy with this. So this looks almost like a painting. Still a little bit too smooth here in the face compared to the surroundings. But th this is best so far. Uh, so if I, uh, instead of uh, <laughs> Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa painting as input here, I had a video, <clears throat> I could split the video into still frames and then do a face replacement on each single frame and then put the frames back into a video. And that way I would have done a deep fake video with, with face replacements. And this could of course be automated. Especially if the face is still all the time. So then I can use the same um, uh, mask here. So then it's very, very easy. But if the face moves around, uh, I can either draw a mask manually for each frame. That's just going to take time because even a four second video is going to be, if it's 30 frames each video, pretty long time. But it's doable. You can do it in a, maybe two hours. Pretty boring. So you would probably want to automate it. So I don't know what you can do with this batch. Images and directory. So this is noise. I don't know if you can do a mask in this batch. Uh, but if you can do a mask in the batch, then it, and the face is in the pretty much the same place the whole video. Then you could use this here tab to actually do a complete deep fake video. That would be interesting. But you could definitely use this to use to do a deep fake if you uh, process the entire image. 
but most of the time you maybe only you only want to replace the face and not the entire image. Yeah, so that was an introduction to Stable Diffusion. Of course, go to the website to read more about it if you're interested in exactly how it works. Thanks for watching or something. And now I just have to figure out how to turn this off. Ha, ha, ha.